The quadcopter you're going to see me build in this video, the Luminaire QAVS Mini, was sent to me by FPV Crate for me to use in this video. I have not received any money in exchange for this video, uh, and uh, Luminaire, FPV Crate, Get FPV, nobody has had any editorial control or input or even really seen this video before it was released. This is the Flywheel Explorer based on the original design by Dave C. And Dave C was one of the first guys to realize that a lightweight four inch quadcopter could be one of the most fun ways to enjoy FPV. If you really wanna know why, I'll put a link to my review of the Flywheel Explorer down in the video description and you can go check it out. And since the Flywheel Explorer came out, there have been a whole lot of lightweight, long range, four inch quadcopters. And in fact, I did a review of like four or five of them. I'll put a link to that playlist down in the video description and you can check that out as well. But that's not what we're here for today. Those were all binded flies. But if you wanna build your own, that's what we're here for today. Because FPV Crate has come out with a build kit for their QAVS four inch long range. And it actually is available in a four inch and a five inch version and in a freestyle focused and a long range focused version and in a digital and an analog version. And that's what we're gonna do in this video. We're gonna build the FPV Crate Lumineer QAVS long range. I'll walk you through all the steps of the build. We'll talk about the different variants. We'll just have a good time along the way. I'm Joshua Bardwell. You're gonna learn something today. I wanna to start as you usually do by opening up the uh, FPV crate and taking a look at the stuff that comes in the kit. Uh, and you'll see that what we've got here are the Cinewhoop three inch props. The FPV crate kit is actually the three inch version. We've got the QAVS mini uh, hardware kit, the QAVS mini frame. And this is the Cadex Nebula Pro. And that is, if you're gonna do the digital version, this is the antenna. Here is a GPS. That's gonna be for the four inch only. The GPS, here are some four inch props, these four by two props. Uh, the two blade props are gonna be more efficient for long range flying. Here are the 1404 motors. Hmm, 2800 kV. That seems like the 1404, 2800 kV, that's what most of these long range guys are doing on four inch props. Beta FPV all-in-one 20 amp toothpick flight controller. And we've also got here some 1507 motors. Those are gonna be for the three inch props uh, and they're available in 3800 KV for 4S or 2700 KV for 6S. And FPV Crate has also sent me a Baby Rattel and a Unified Pro 32 Nano for those of you who are gonna do an analog build. And I'm gonna show you how to do both of those. But I'm not gonna show you how to do all the different motors because I think installing all these different motors would be, maybe it'd be fun to swap out the different motors and arms to try three inch versus four inch. I think the way that is gonna be most enjoyable to fly this is gonna be as a four inch cruiser. Um, and so that's the one that I'm gonna build up. If you choose to go a different direction though, it's gonna be very simple. The build is gonna be the same. You're just gonna use different arms and different motors and you're gonna follow along with the whole build. We'll start with all the parts of the frame and I love it when manufacturers separate and label their screws. It makes assembly so much easier if you've never done it before. Even if you have done it before, it just makes it easier to get exactly what you need. The arms on the QAVS four inch uh, are dead cat style. And what that means is that the front arms are straight out to keep the props out of view of the camera and the rear arms go backward. The reason it's called a dead cat style is because way back when some dude actually taxidermied his cat, the cat died of natural causes. He taxidermied the cat and built the cats into a, into a quadcopter and the quadcopter's arms were like this and everyone calls them dead cat now. Uh, it's morbid, but it's true. <laughs> the next thing I'm gonna do is get this front part of the bottom plate and I'm gonna begin installing these M3 by 12 screws. Uh, there are four of them. And I'm gonna install them one, two, three, four. Can't really get this wrong because all the other screw holes in this particular plate are 
M2 in size. You can't really screw it up, so that's nice. Next, I'm going to install the arms. One, two, three, four. And then this plate is going to go like this in the middle. We can squeeze that just a little bit if we need to, to help that stay in place. And then this plate is going to go on and we're going to do that with these press nuts facing up and it's going to slide on over. And again, there's really, it's going to be difficult for you to get that wrong because again, there are only so many M3 size holes drilled in that plate. And that's what we're going to end up with. Then I'm going to take the standoffs and you should note that there are M3 size standoffs and there are M2 size standoffs. You're going to need the M3 size standoffs to go on the M3 screws. Again, you can't really screw this up, <laughs> screw it up because the other ones won't go on. Next, I'm going to take one of these M2 by 5 screws uh, and a 1.5 millimeter driver and put that through this middle hole here. And it will go up into the central press nut here in this plate. And I'm just going to loosely insert that for now. Next, I'm going to take one of these little wedge pieces and I'm going to insert it into the side with the wedge facing in. And it's going to line up with this little screw hole here. That little wedge piece is going to be held in with one of these M2 by 8 screws. And the other one's going to be exactly the same on the other side. And once you've gotten this far, you can go ahead and tighten down all these screws. Uh, for the M2 screws, it is pretty easy to strip them and sort of rip off the heads if you go crazy. So don't go crazy. Next, we're going to start to prep the flight controller. This is the Beta FPV 20 amp all-in-one toothpick style flight controller. A toothpick style refers to the toothpick uh, build done by Kebab. Well, he wasn't the first to do it, but he certainly popularized this toothpick style of quadcopter. Uh, it was originally a Tiny Whoop Electronics with three inch props and a 1S battery and it's grown since then. The toothpick style of flight controller today refers to a flight controller with 25 millimeter spacing on the standoffs and a built in ESC and flight controller in one. So this is the whole flight control stack is just gonna be right here. So first we're gonna take this packet of accessories that comes with it. We're gonna get out these little silicon uh, gummies they're called. And we're gonna install those gummies in the standoff holes and it's a little tricky to get them to go. And it's just a little tricky to get the camera to hold still and show you guys, but I've kind of got it half started. And then what I like to do is just come in from the other side and kind of push it the rest of the way through. Be very careful not to damage the electronics when you're doing this. And be very careful not to tear the silicone gummy. Don't use a, a sharp object like a pointy a pointy uh, tweezers or something. Use a blunt object. Oh, come on, you're so close. There we go. Got it installed. So we're just going to do one, two, three, four, just like that. All right, that's done. I think the next thing I want to do is install the XT30 lead, the battery lead. And the amount of wire that they've stripped back there, to me, that seems a little inadequate. So I'm going to give myself a little more wire here. That's a little too much wire, but that's okay. We'll fix that. 
whenever something comes factory soldered, they always use lead-free solder because factories have to use lead-free solder for environmental reasons. But I always encourage hobbyists to use leaded solder, at least if you're in a place where you can get it. I know some Europeans uh, can't get it. Uh, lead-free solder is okay, but leaded solder works better and it's completely safe as long as you do not eat it. The fumes that you see up here are not good for you to breathe. <sighs> They're not good for you to breathe, but the fumes are from the flux that's in the solder. They are not lead fumes, so you're not breathing lead. And if you have lead-free solder, you're still going to get the same flux fumes. Um, the only downside of leaded solder is, number one, that will put a small amount of lead into the environment when you dispose of it. If you're a factory who's making just millions and millions and millions of things, yeah, that matters. But if you're a hobbyist who solders up one or two quadcopters in a year, I don't think it freaking matters. And uh, leaded solder just flows better. So I always go over uh, factory joints with fresh solder. Even if you're working with lead-free solder, it's probably a good idea just to get some fresh flux in there. I'm going to trim these guys down to about, I guess about maybe three millimeters. I can see that I didn't get them hot enough either. Ugh. I didn't get them hot. This is not a soldering tutorial, but I didn't get them hot enough because you can see that that ball of solder did not soak into the wires. I was busy talking to the camera and I wasn't like paying attention to what I was doing. Uh, we want to see the solder soak into the wires and not just be floating on top of it. That means it didn't get hot enough. So that's basically what I want to see. I got about three millimeters of length and nice tin silver, nice tin silver wires. Now I think I'd like to have the wires coming out the top of the flight controller. So what I'm going to do is let's make sure we get it right. Minus plus black goes in the minus red goes in the plus. I'm just going to stick them down through there and I'll flip it over like so. This blue putty that I'm using is called Blue Tack. Uh, it's not intended for soldering, but it works really well for soldering for holding things in place. You can find it at, you know, art supply stores, drugstores, Amazon, etc. If you're building the QAVS mini frame with a traditional 20 millimeter or 16 millimeter flight stack, then your mounting holes are going to go in these slits here. For 20 millimeter stack, they'll go towards the outside. For a 16 millimeter, they'll go towards the inside. And you'll see that those holes just fit through the bottom of the frame. If you're using a toothpick style flight controller like we are, then it's going to mount on these four holes. One, two, three, Four. And you can see that two of those screws are actually the same two screws that are holding those little arrowhead shaped pieces that hold the arms together. So what we're going to need to do is actually remove these screws. I, um, I had you put them in just because I kind of wanted you to see how the frame goes together. But we're going to remove those screws and replace them with one of the spares that came with the kit. And they actually include several different lengths of screw depending on what type of stack your building. So you see we've got a 20 millimeter, a 14 millimeter, and I think the 14 millimeter seems to work the best for this. On the front and the back, you're only going through this single plate. You're not going through the whole arm and bottom plate. So instead of using a 14 millimeter, we're going to use a 10 millimeter screw, and that's going to give us about the same height for this front and back screw as for the two side screws. GetFPV has also included some of these nylon M2 nuts, and we're gonna use those to hold the screws in place and also use them as a shim to um, make up for the height of the press nut, which is not present on the front and back screws. There we go. We can install the flight controller just by pressing it down over those four screws and make sure you install it facing forward. This front facing arrow points forward and the XT60 comes out the rear.
Next, we'll install the motors. Uh, we're going to be putting the F1404 motors on because we're doing the 4-inch build, but you'll put whichever motors you're using for your build, obviously. The T-Motor F1404s come with M2 mounting screws, and I want you to be careful because these screws, the longer ones, those are intended for the props. These use T-mount style props, which are also mounted with M2 screws. So use these short screws to mount the motor. If you use the long screws, they will protrude up into the motor windings and damage the motor. Well, now the motors are installed, and in fact, a, a few other steps have been performed that you didn't see because I didn't hit record on this camera, so they were lost. Let me catch you up. <laughs> uh, I routed the wires and I used my signature red electrical tape to tape the wires down to the arm. Uh, in, in some builds, I would have routed the wires along the front or the back of the arm, depending on which way the props were spinning. If the props are spinning outward, I would route the wires along the front of the arm so that if a prop gets bent downward, it spins around and it deflects off the back of the arm and then it doesn't hit the wires. For, for three inches and below, I kind of don't think you need to do that because those small props don't tend to bend downward. They're just so short that they don't bend downward. For four inches, maybe, but I'm going to go ahead and live dangerously and just tape them to the top of the arm. Then I tinned the motor pads, one, two, three, and four. Uh, it's really easy to get a solder bridge when you're tinning these. And let me show you what to do if that happens. So I'm just going to create a solder bridge between these two pads by putting a little too much solder on. Bingo. Now the pads are bridged. And if that happens, that's going to fry your ESC. It's bad. Just take a dry t soldering iron with no solder on it and just swipe between them. And it'll pick up a little bit of extra solder and clear the bridge. The next thing I'm going to do is cut the wires to the correct length. Um, and what I'd like to do is... I'm going to press them up against the frame. I don't want to just pull them taut because then they won't have any slack. In fact, you, you generally like them to have a little too much slack rather than a, not enough. So I'm just going to press them down and when they get to the pad, I'm going to cut them off just a, maybe five millimeters past the pad roughly. Give me just enough room to uh, strip and tin them and solder them down. The next thing we need to do is install the camera and the video transmitter and the receiver, and then we'll have a finished build. And I want to show how to do this with DJI, which a lot of people are going to be using, but I also want to show how to do it with analog. Uh, so here's what I think I'm going to do. I'm going to show the DJI part first, because it actually is really simple to install DJI in this quad. It doesn't even require you to solder to the flight controller at all. And that means that when I'm done showing you how to do DJI, I can just unplug the DJI, fling it aside, and do the analog build. So there's a table of contents down in the video description, and there should be chapter markers on the timeline down below uh, in the YouTube window. And, and if you're not doing the DJI part, then you can just go find the next chapter and skip ahead, and I'll see you there. And what's so cool about this flight controller, this is the V4 of the Beta FPV toothpick, they've added these plugs. This is the plug for the um, DJI, and this is the plug for the receiver. And it'll simply plug in. The, fl the flight controller comes with this plug, and the Caddx Vista comes with the same plug. So you can use either of them, whichever one you want. Actually, it looks like the plug that comes with the Beta FPV flight controller it's not quite long enough, so we will be using the one that came with the Cadex. But unfortunately, some soldering is going to be required. We're going to solder the wires up to these pads on the Vista. Don't freak out by the fact that there's already some solder on there. They just solder that on and they test it at the factory. And we're going to solder it up according to this wiring diagram. 
By the way, kudos to Beta FPV for the documentation on this flight controller. I'll put a link to the product page for this flight controller down in the video description so you can see all the wiring diagrams and other instructions that come with it. I was going to make these wiring diagrams because I assumed that no one else had done it. And I went to their product page and sure enough, they have all the stuff you would need. So basically, you're going to start with the red and black wires, which are going to be uh, power and ground. What do they label it as? Just V, V and G. And you're just going to work your way over from left to right following this diagram. Hey there folks, Joshua from the future here. If you are using the DJI controller, then you need this SBUS wire that I'm soldering up. But if you're using any other kind of controller like Crossfire, Tracer, FreeSky, if you're using any other receiver, do not solder up that SBUS wire, the last yellow wire, do not solder that up. And in fact, remove it from the plug because it's gonna get in your way later. Only do that if you're using some other controller and receiver. If you're using the DJI controller, you do need the SBUS wire. The other thing we need to do is install the antenna. And the easiest way to do that, in my opinion, is to remove this screw and slide out the antenna holder. You're then going to take this 3D printed piece and pass the antenna wire through it. You can't do it after it's installed, so you got to do it before you install the antenna. And it's just going to press down in there. That's a snug fit. Okay. There you go. There's your antenna. Then I'm going to snap down this UFL connector here on its receptacle. There we go. And then there's a little pin right here that holds one side of this retaining bracket. It's the side with the small hole here, the side of the big hole gets the screw through it. And it can be really hard to get that pin seated. And that's why I take the screw out. So then we're just gonna take this and we're gonna slide it back up underneath there. And we're just gonna push that back into place. And you can see it doesn't quite line up perfectly, but then once we insert the screw, it'll be fine. And then uh, all you gotta do is just plug it in. Bingo. Oh, come on now. Plug in. Plug it in. Just like that. There we go. That's all the way in. Plug it in, and then uh, you mount it. To mount the Vista, we're going to crack into this QAVS Mini hardware kit, which includes some supplemental hardware for the build. And we're going to find this bag here. And in this bag, we're going to have some of these screws. And these look like they are just the right length to mount the Vista. Let's see if I'm right about that. So we're gonna take those screws and we're gonna put them through one, two, three, four holes on the underside of the QAVS. And they're gonna go up through those holes on the Vista. Yeah, perfect, oh, perfect, that's fantastic. Good on, good on you guys. There's also a bag of these, a whole ton of spare M2 washers. There's like way more in there than you could possibly need. I'm not sure why they sent that many, but you know, hey, I'm not going to turn down free hardware. Just screw that on. And we're going to do that with all four of them uh, and just screw it right down and hold it in place. If you've got the analog version of this kit, then it comes with the TBS Unify Pro Nano video transmitter. This is a really good video transmitter uh, for the size. It outputs, I think, up to 400 milliwatts, and it's just really amazing performance for something this small. It also comes with this mounting board, and I think I'm going to try using this, although you certainly don't have to. One reason to use it is that soldering wires to these tiny little pads can be tricky, and also it gives you a 20 millimeter mounting uh, mechanism, uh, which is going to work with the 20 millimeter mounting holes on the back of the frame. Of course, you could always just tape it down and use a zip tie like the old fashioned way, but I'm going to give this a go. So what we're going to need to do is just stick this in here and solder it in here. And the correct way to do it is with the antenna connector facing up, you sort of, I don't know, you just jam it in and friction should hold it there while you solder. Definitely don't get it upside down though. 
definitely do not get it upside down because if you've got it the wrong way around, then you'll fry it when you power up and you don't want to do that. By the way, there are also mounting holes for a Crossfire Nano or Tracer receiver if you want to mount one there uh, and output pads for that. The video transmitter also comes with a handful of wires, so we're going to strip and tin the wires uh, in preparation for soldering them up to the board. So here's the result after soldering up the wires. You can see I haven't soldered up all the wires, uh, and the reason for that is that we are not using the 5 volt output. Uh, here, it, uh, we're going to use the 5 volt output from the flight controller to power the camera. So all we need is voltage input to power the VTX, smart audio so we can remote control the VTX and change band power channel, etc., and the video out wire. That's all we need. And then we have to mount this in the frame. And in order to do that, I'm going to take this hardware kit that comes with the QAVS Mini and... In there is an assortment of extra M2 hardware and some little M2 nuts. And I think the simplest thing to do is to get some of these short M2 screws and just uh, mount it on the back of the frame. Let me show you what I mean by that. On the back of the frame is a 20 millimeter mounting hole here. And I'm going to just put the screw through the mounting holes. Uh, we're going to do all four of them, of course. And on the other side, I'm going to take some of these M2 nuts and use them just as spacers to keep it from rubbing up against the carbon. I think I'm going to need more than one. Let's see. So here we've got two nuts on here making a double high spacer and then this is going to go on top it's going to go facing forward, of course. It's going to go on top like this, and one more nut will go on top to hold it in place. And you're going to go at all four of those locations, so it's just going to sort of mount. Here are the pads that you're going to solder to on the flight controller. They are going to be ground, 5 volt out, video out, which is just labeled out, and T6, uh, UART6 transmit, is going to be used for smart audio, and they are going to get soldered up like so. We're also going to install this antenna. This is a Luminaire Axi uh, antenna. It's going to get plugged into the video transmitter's UFL connector. And uh, it's really, really important that you never power up the video transmitter with the antenna removed. Well, it, that's really important for other video transmitters for sure. The TBS Unify video transmitters and a few other high quality ones will not instantly self-destruct if you power them up with no antenna. They're somewhat resilient. It's still not a good idea. Some video transmitters will just instantly self-destruct if you do that. So I always make a habit of installing the antenna at this point in the build in case later I power up and forget where the antenna will be installed. The camera that's been provided is the Cadex Baby Rattel 2. This is a nano-sized camera, but the, um, the frame is sized for a micro-sized camera, so this is too small. And it comes with this... Uh, rubber, I don't know, uh, adapter that you're going to need to install uh, in order for it to fit in the frame. And then we've got this wire that it comes with, and what you're going to do is cut one end of the wire off. It's going to plug into the camera on one side, and the other side is going to solder the flight controller. So I'm just going to snip one end off. There actually were two in the box, so it's nice to have a spare, I guess. And here's the result after soldering up the camera header. The camera's video wire is right over here on the video out or video in pad in between the video transmitter video wire and the T6 wire. 
And then this camera needs to be powered from 5 volts. It cannot take battery voltage like many cameras. Most nano-sized cameras only take 5 volts input. Uh, they could even take 3.3 volts, I think. Uh, anyway, so we needed to find a spare 5 volt pad, and there's a spare 5 volt and ground pad over on the other side. This is a really full-featured video transmitter, I mean a flight controller, considering it's like a micro-sized flight controller for tiny whoops and toothpicks. It's got a bunch of spare UARTs. It's, it's got a lot going on. Made FPV, good job. The next thing we've got to do is wire up the receiver. And if you're using the DJI controller with the Cadex Vista, then you can skip this section because it's already done. The Cadex Vista is the receiver, the controller binds to the Vista, and the inputs to the flight controller come in via the DJI plug. The Vista is not currently installed if you're keeping up with the video, but don't let that throw you off. Any other kind of receiver that you might use is going to plug into the flight controller using this plug. Yes, you can direct solder it if you prefer, but they've really made your life easy by including this wire harness, which plugs in here. It has four wires, and exactly how you wire it up is going to depend on what kind of receiver you're using. Here's the wiring diagram if you're using a crossfire or tracer receiver like I'm going to be doing. If you're using any other kind of receiver, there are wiring diagrams at the Beta FPV website. And again, there's a link to that down in the video description. One really important thing to take note of is that you will need to bridge this solder bridge uh, according to the type of receiver that you're using. If you're using a FreeSky SBUS receiver or any other receiver that outputs SBUS, I guess there are some others, then you'll bridge the solder bridge one way, and if you're using pretty much any other kind of receiver, you'll bridge the other way. The wiring diagrams at the Beta FPV website show the correct solder bridge position for each type of receiver, and you're basically gonna create a bridge between the center and one side, or between the center and the other side, but not between all three. If you don't do that, your receiver isn't gonna work. Annoyingly, the colors of the wires on the harness that was sent with the flight controller don't match the colors on the wiring diagram, but I've basically wired it up as shown. And now to take care of that solder bridge. Next, we're going to come over here to the computer and set up the quadcopter in Betaflight. And a couple notes before we dive into this section. Number one, this section is for setting up if you're doing analog video transmitter and camera. Again, there is another section if you're using digital and it's in the table of contents down in the video description. And if you look at the chapter markers on the timeline, you should be able to find it there. The other thing I want to say is that a lot of times when I do a build tutorial, it'll be a super detailed build tutorial as if you had never experienced some of this stuff before. And that's not what I'm going to do here. So in a couple places, I'm going to make reference to another video that I might have made that goes through the steps that you might need to do. I'm going to focus in here on things that are unique to this specific build. And the first thing that I want to do is, as always, update the firmware to the latest version of Betaflight. And I see here that we've got Betaflight 422 on here. Betaflight, I think the latest is like 428. Um, so what I'm going to do is look right here where it says target beta FPV F405 right there. I'm going to make a note of that and I'm going to go to update firmware. And I'm going to choose beta FPV F405 right here, firmware 428. Normally before flashing firmware, I would save the config dump of the flight controller, but since we, it's on, it, we haven't configured anything, it's on defaults, so there's nothing to save. So I'm just going to go ahead and flash that. Alrighty, that is done. Let's go ahead and connect. We will apply custom defaults, always apply custom defaults after, uh, after flashing the board and we'll follow these steps as well. Calibrate the accelerometer. The next thing I like to do in any build is get the receiver working. Uh, in this case, we have the TBS tracer receiver. I'm going to need to bind it and update the firmware on it. If you're working with tracer or crossfire, I do have a tutorial video about how to get those set up. I also have a tutorial video for Immersion RC Ghost, and I probably have a video for FreeSky 2 somewhere. I'll put links to those down in the video description, as well as any other reference videos that I mentioned in this, uh, in this section.
In order to bind, I'm going to need to plug in a battery. This flight controller does not power the receiver when plugged into USB. And since it's the first time I've plugged in a battery, I'm using a V-Fly smoke saver, short saver. It's a smoke stopper. If you've got a short circuit in your build, it may save you from uh, smoking your components. I've got a video about that. I'll put a link in the video description. Where else? Now that the receiver is bound, the next thing to do is to set up the Betaflight ports tab. And the good news is all of the receivers that you would use with this flight controller all come in on the same UART. So the Serial RX on UART 3 is enabled by default. And as long as you use that plug, there isn't really a reason to change that. Very nice of Beta FPV to do that for us. We're going to go to the Configuration tab. And we're going to change the receiver protocol. In my case, it's going to be Crossfire and you'll set it to whatever is right for your type of receiver. And save and reboot. Lastly, we've got to set up the video transmitter and the video transmitter smart audio wire. We connected that to T6, which is UART6 transmit pad. So we're going to go to UART6 in the ports tab and we're going to change the peripheral to smart audio and save. Then we're going to go to the video transmitter tab and we're going to need to put in the VTX table for this video transmitter. And we can get that information here from the Pro32 Nano product page. If we scroll all the way down to the bottom, we've got the VTX table for Betaflight. And let's find the Pro32 Nano Pro Nano, not Pro32 Nano. Here's the Pro32 Nano. And we're just gonna take this text and copy it. And we're gonna just go into the CLI and paste that in and type the word save. I'll put that text down in the video description so you can easily copy paste it from there. Once you've imported the VTX table, you can then control the channel band and power of your video transmitter using this menu or using your on-screen display or one of many other ways of, of doing that. But before any of that can work, you're probably going to want to unlock your video transmitter by default. TBS Unified video transmitters are locked at 25 milliwatts and they will not go like to most race band channels. Uh, how to unlock it. I've got a video about how to unlock any of the Pro32 video transmitters and I'll put a link to that in the video description. Now let's go over how to set up Betaflight if you built the quad with the DJI system, uh, the Cadex Vista or whatever. Uh, and as I said for the analog chapter, uh, I will be doing just the stuff that is unique to this build and for all the stuff that is common to sort of every build, I'm going to give you links and references to other videos. So we're going to go ahead and plug in USB and connect to Betaflight. And we'll start in the ports tab. And the only change we're going to need to make in the ports tab is to enable the MSP protocol for UART4. That's going to let your DJI goggles get battery voltage and other OSD elements uh, from the flight controller and we will save and reboot. By the way, if you want your OSD to appear in your DJI goggles, you're going to need to go into the goggles and make sure in the display menu that the show custom OSD option is enabled. Next, we'll go to the configuration tab and we're going to need to set up our receiver protocol. Uh, the receiver type that you're going to select will depend on what controller you're using. If you're using the DJI controller, then you're going to set your serial receiver provider to SBUS. And if you're using any other kind of receiver, like FreeSky would be SBUS, Crossfire and Tracer would be Crossfire, and so on. We're going to set that correct for the type of receiver that we're using. If you are going to be using Crossfire, Ghost, uh, or any other kind of receiver, I'm going to put a link in the video description to some of the tutorials that I've got. I don't have tutorials for every type of receiver setup, but I have it for some, and I'll put links in the video description to those for you. For best performance with the DJI system, it's recommended that you use fast SBUS, which is just like SBUS, but lower latency, faster. In order to do this, you will need to go into the device menu in your goggles and enable the fast SBUS option. And then here in Betaflight, you will need to go to the command line option, the CLI tab, and type set SBUS baud fast equals on, and then save, type save. The next thing you're going to need to do is activate the Cadex Vista firmware update on it using the DJI FPV Assistant app, bind it to the goggles, and if you're using the controller, 
bind it to the controller. I've got a video where I go through the full setup of a DJI Quad. I'm going to put that down in the video description. The beautiful thing is that for DJ, basically all DJI Quads are the same to set up because it's all the same gear. Um, once you've got movement in the receiver tab and your channel mapping is correct and all that stuff is done, your goggles are bound, etc., then you're also going to go to the modes tab and you're going to set up your flight modes with the DJI controller. If you're not using the DJI controller, there are instructions elsewhere in this video for how to do this with the kind of controller that you're using or links in the video description. Having done that, we'll go to the receiver tab and we should have movement in the receiver tab when I move the sticks on the controller and sure enough, I do. At this point, the next thing to do is to check your channel mapping and your endpoints. If you don't know how to do that, I've got a video about how to do that and I'll put a link in the video description. The next thing to do is to go into the modes tab and set up your aux modes so that you can arm the quadcopter when you flip switches and put it in angle mode and acro mode and all that other stuff. I've got a tutorial about how to do that. And once again, it's down in the video description. Here in the configuration tab, I'm going to set the motor protocol from DSHOT 600 to DSHOT 300, especially if you're going to use bi-directional DSHOT and RPM filtering. That's a good idea for uh, F4 processors, uh, and I do think those are worth doing. I'm going to go ahead and enable those options and save and reboot. Since we've enabled RPM filtering, we're also going to want to change the dynamic notch filter settings. Uh, and the way we're going to change that is we're going to set dynamic notch width percent to zero, dynamic notch Q to 250, min hertz to 90, and max hertz to 350. Don't worry too much about why you make these exact changes. In fact, in Betaflight 4.3, they just do it automatically. These are just better settings for when you're using RPM filtering. And then we're going to go here to the motors tab and we just want to check, first of all, that we have 0% errors. That confirms that bi-directional D-shot is working and we're going to test our motors. Now I've got the props off here and what I'm going to do is I'm going to check my motor directions and make sure that the motors are spinning the same direction as indicated here on this diagram. If they're not spinning in that direction, you need to go into Beald Heli Suite and reverse the motor directions to get them spinning the right way. And I've got a tutorial about how to do that, again, linked down in the video description. A few other changes I like to make in Betaflight on all of my quadcopters include removing the maximum arm angle, which lets the quadcopter arm when it's tilted. By default, it won't arm when it's tilted past 25 degrees, which means if it's sitting on a rock or a hill, then it won't take off. Um, it also prevents it from arming if you've accidentally picked it up and you're carrying it and then you accidentally flip the arm switch, but you shouldn't do that. And I'd rather, I always set this to 180 degrees on my quads. Since I'm using tracer, I'm also going to turn on telemetry. You'd want to do that with any receiver that had was telemetry capable, uh, TPS tracer, crossfire ghost, um, even free sky. If you're using smart port telemetry, there isn't a buzzer on this quadcopter. And so I'm going to turn on the D shot beacon. Uh, what that means is that instead of a buzzer beeping, the motors will make a beeping noise, just like when you first plug in the battery, then it can be really helpful. If you crash the quad and you can't find it, you've got some kind of beeping to actually try and help you homing in, home in on where it is. Some people who are doing this build are going to install a GPS on the quad. This is, I think, especially likely if you're doing the four inch build, the three inch, I mean, hey, you put a GPS on anything you want, but the three inch may not have enough range to really make GPS make sense. And you're more likely to fly the three inch in tighter locations where GPS could just get you in trouble or where you wouldn't get a GPS lock in the first place. So this is the GPS we're working with. This is a really good GPS too. And the kit comes with this 3D print, which is gonna go over the rear standoffs on the quad eventually when we put it together. And I guess I just, I gotta figure out, is it just like slide down in? I think that looks like what it does. I don't wanna break it. After quite a lot of fiddling around, the best way to install this into the 3D printed mount seems to be, first of all, pass the cable through and plug it in and then begin to install it and then kind of fold back so you can press straight in there you go just like that yeah, that went pretty smoothly now that I know how to do it. Now this is going to install on the back standoffs. 
So we'll just place it there while we route the wires. And the wires are going to solder roughly here. So we'll just run those over there. With a little bit of slack and cut them to length. Now as far as where we're going to solder this up, uh, we're going to be using UART1, which there is R1 and T1 over here next to where the receiver plugs in. And for power, we're going to be using the 3.3 volt output on the flight controller. It's always good to run a GPS off 3.3 volts. Two reasons. GPSs that are rated for 5 volts oftentimes will still work better on 3.3 volts. They won't like burn up on five volts, but they will probably they will like get faster satellite lock and so on. Not always true, but sometimes true. Um, and the other thing is that the 3.3 volt output is always powered from USB, which means that you can you can configure your GPS and you can power up your GPS before your video transmitter gets powered up, and that'll cause your GPS to get faster lock uh, because it's not getting interference from the GP uh, from the video transmitter. Um, what I mean is you can you can plug like a USB power bank into your flight controller, your GPS will power up. You know, just wait five or ten minutes while you get your goggles ready and stuff, and then you'll plug your battery in. And now your video transmitter comes on, and now that the GPS has lock, it'll be good to go. Anyway, that doesn't work every time, but basically always run your GPS off 3.3 volts. Some fiddly freaking solder. Good luck. <laughs> to get the GPS working in beta flight, first we're going to go to the ports tab. And we are going to go to UART1. That's the UART we hooked it up to. And we're going to change sensor input to GPS and save and reboot. Next, we're going to go to the configuration tab and we're going to go to the GPS configuration. There we go. GPS is right here. We're going to enable GPS. And generally what you want to do for beta flight is change the protocol to UBlocks. You want to enable auto baud and enable use Galileo. And uh, ground assistance type, yeah, can't hurt, right? North American, well, I'm in North America. Set it to whatever, uh, ooh, auto detect. Hmm. Save and reboot. Now at this point, you should see the GPS icon lit up right here, and that indicates that Betaflight is talking to the GPS. It does not mean that you're gonna see any satellites lock, in fact, Right now we're indoors. So if I go to the GPS tab, I'm not going to see any satellites, period. But you should be able to set it outside for about maybe five or 10 minutes for the first lock. And then after that, it should lock very quickly. In addition to that, if you want to use your GPS for fail safe and return to home, which that's naturally why you're probably using it, you're going to want to go into the fail safe tab and set up some of these GPS parameters. I've got another video I made about how to configure these parameters. I'll put that in the video description. And I've got another video I made about how to test GPS fail safe mode. If you just activate GPS rescue and it doesn't work, the quad will just fall out of the air, which could cause it to be damaged or lost. So there's a way to test GPS rescue without that risk. I made a video about it and you know where it is. Now it's time to finish putting the quadcopter all together. And as you can see, I've got Vista back in there, uh, but the steps should be the same, whether you've got a Vista over here or a Unify, and obviously the camera is basically the same. Uh, one thing I do want to note, if you've installed the Vista, these little plastic uh, M2 nuts, they, they don't hold if you tighten them down snugly. Um, so I suggest that you use these metal nuts. These come with the Beta FPV flight controller. Use these metal nuts to hold the Vista down so it's good and snug. Otherwise, when the frame kind of flexes, it may get ripped out. And use these plastic ones for the flight controller because it, it has gummies and it's not going to be under a lot of stress anyway. So I'm just going to put a couple of those on there. Next, we're going to get the remaining standoffs and install them. You'll see there's two long standoffs for the front and two short standoffs for the rear of the quad because the it's got the split deck design. And we're going to be using these screws, which are, I don't even know which freaking size screws they are. Are these eight millimeter-ish? They seem like they might be eights. Seems like that's about right. You generally want more threads 
on the M2 standoffs than you would on an M3 because M2 screws are just smaller and they don't grab as well. At some point before you finish up the build, there's one other thing you're going to need to do with this antenna. Let me pop this guy back off of here. Um, I asked GetFPV how they're supposed to mount it to the frame, and there isn't a, like a dedicated 3D print that perfectly holds this antenna like they have for some of their other frames. Instead, what they said they've done is they've included some heat shrink, and the idea is that you will cut this heat shrink into sections, you will heat shrink it onto the cable, and just keep heat shrinking it till it thickens up the cable. And then you will use the same 3D print that I used for the Vista. Basically just run the antenna down in there and the heat shrink, or you could even use tape or whatever, will just kind of stick in there. I, maybe a zip tie around it to help cinch it down. I, I think that's a pretty, I'm not a giant, that's pretty, you know, that's what they're, that's how they're delivering it. So that's how we're going to do it. With the standoffs installed, I'm now going to begin to put these 3D printed pieces in place. The GPS will just press down on the rear standoff, like so. And then, hmm. And then for the Vista antenna, I kind of don't want it just like hanging out here. So I'm going to see if I can just give it a little bit of a half circle. Yeah, that's going to work fine. And that's going to kind of keep it in place and out of the way. Make sure not to pinch it or any of the other wires as you press this guy down. Almost as if it was designed to be exactly the right height for the standoff. Very nice. Next we're going to mount the camera and we're going to use these side plates here. Um, make sure you've got the little arc facing the right direction so the camera can tilt up. And also make sure you install the camera with the lettering facing the right direction. If you do install it upside down, you can flip it in software, but why put yourself through that? Hmm. No. Oh. Well, it looks like the Nebula Pro only has a single screw, unlike the Vista, which has two screws to hold the angle. We'll just have to rely on friction to hold the up tilt angle of the camera. That's okay, I guess. And like I showed you earlier, I'm going to give this just enough twists that it starts to take up its own slack. There we go. So that it doesn't want to pop out and get chopped while I'm flying. And the last thing I need to do is figure out where I'm going to mount this receiver. You could mount the receiver right on top of the flight controller. It's not really ideal. It just doesn't feel right to have the receiver mounted right on top of the gyro and I don't know, it just doesn't seem right. Can we fit it behind here? No. Hmm. I kind of wish I'd used longer wires. Yeah, it'll just reach back here. Maybe it'll reach. I mean, I cut it so it would reach, so it should freaking reach, right? Yeah, it'll it'll reach. It'll be fine. I'll just take some double-sided tape here. And get this mounted. And I never fully trust double-sided tape. Well, seldom. I seldom fully trust double-sided tape, especially when it's on an uneven surface like this. So I'm going to back it up with a zip tie. Whenever you zip tie something down, make really sure, like a common mistake would be to zip tie over the receiver's bind button so the zip tie would press the bind button. Um, or there's a button right here on the Vista. I'm not, I'm going to, and I'm going to keep the zip tie away from those things so it doesn't accidentally like press it. I don't need these zip ties to be super snug because they're just there to kind of keep the tape honest. There you go. 
The exact way to mount the antenna is going to differ depending on what type of receiver you're using. If you have a Crossfire Immortal T, I would try to zip tie it across the back like this. With Tracer, I'm going to try to put them up underneath the arms because Tracer has diversity. So something like that, I don't know. Um, and for a typical free scry receiver, I would put a zip tie around the arm, zip tie facing forward, and then heat shrink the antenna to the zip tie. I've got a video about antenna mounting that shows a couple of those techniques. I'll link it in the video description. Now we're going to go ahead and install the top plate. I'm using M2 by 6 screws here. There were tons of spares. Um, you could use 8s if you wanted a little more strength, I guess. Uh, and there should be a couple of M3s left somewhere. There we go. M3 by 6 for the M3 standoffs. I'm going to go ahead and set the camera angle and tighten up the camera. And we'll install the battery pad. Boom. Awesome. And now we got a quadcopter. All that's left to do is install the props and go maiden it. A couple of notes about that. Um, if you've never installed props on a quadcopter because this is your first one, I have a video about how to do that correctly. You definitely want to get that correct because if you get it wrong, the quad can, well, the best thing that'll happen is it'll refuse to fly. And the worst thing that'll happen is it'll flip out and you could damage itself or maybe even hurt somebody. You don't want that. These are a style of prop called T-mount prop, and that means they have two small screw holes here, and then one hole for the shaft, and you want to use the, I think these are six millimeter screws, but these are the, the screws that came with the motors. If you use a screw that is too long, it will poke the motor windings and damage the motor windings, so you don't want to do that. You just want it to stick out just the tiniest bit. Um, Depending on the motor, I've had T-mount uh, props strip the motor bell out if the screw was not long enough. This is actually really on the edge. Um, these seem to do okay, but you can sometimes get just like a slightly longer screw. You just don't want it to make contact with the windings when you're screwing it in. I've also got a video about how to safely maiden the quadcopter. If you've never maiden one before, how to do that, uh, make sure that everything's going to go okay, and it's not going to flip out. So I'll put a link to all that down in the video description. But that it brings us to the end of the video. I hope you really enjoyed this quadcopter. I hope you have enjoyed building it with me. I sure have enjoyed building it with you. And uh, links in the video description if you want to... Who are we kidding? If you're still watching this video, you already bought this. You don't need the links in the video description. Happy flying. Do you see this baby? Isn't he cute? Hit the subscribe button. Join my Patreon. Use my affiliate links. Or just keep watching videos. That's better than nothing. Coco Kaka, subscribe to my daddy.